All right. Hey, uh, um, good morning, everyone. I want to get this um, uh, discussion started. I do want to um, obviously make sure everyone on the call, we have at last count of maybe 42 or 43 people uh, on the call that, um, that the public and the press are invited um, uh, to this meeting as well. This obviously is an incredibly important issue for all of us. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity um, for as many eyes uh, and hands uh, working towards uh, this, uh, this task of trying to address uh, disparities, um, uh, not just in COVID-19, but really um, uh, the, uh, the issues that so many of you on uh, for many years, uh, long before any of us heard of the coronavirus, uh, or, or COVID-19, other areas of community engagement outside of public health. Uh, but this seemed to be a, a wonderful a chance uh, to get all of us uh, together on one call and to begin a much more robust uh, dialogue about what we can be doing here in the Midlands uh, to try and get our arms around um, this uh, this new and deadly. Uh, we'll get some uh, in a moment. They'll all be fairly brief and tight. And then we're going to have a chance for uh, um, an open discussion um, uh, with Taylor and our team. Uh, I'll have a chance to uh, monitor uh, those of us who raise their hand wanting to, uh, to make a, uh, a comment. One of the great goals here is is determine um, what we're all doing um, so we're not siloed. Uh, oftentimes we're, we're all doing amazing work, uh, some of you again for many years, uh, but maybe sharing that work and if there's some ways for us to serve as a force multiplier uh, for e each other, uh, then um, uh, this is a chance to share that that information. Uh, we, we will have a significant number of public officials, both uh, elected and appointed. Uh, I know the chairman of the county council is on several of uh, Richland County, um, Richland County and um, obviously my colleagues are Columbia City Council on um, several state legislators um, uh, will be on as well. Uh, while this is open to the public, this is not a public meeting. We won't be taking up any issues of um, that we might, have, that we might be voting on at city council. Necessarily, this is fully for um, issues of uh, uh, awareness and again, uh, determining how we might uh, move forward. Uh, we'll get some updated data from um, um, from DHEC, as I mentioned in a second, but just a few days ago, we saw that there were 36% of the cases and 57% of the, of the deaths in, in South Carolina were African American. Uh, we've seen across this country, um, obviously, um, some really troubling data in, in our more dense areas uh, that um, uh, uh, that we're seeing just just incredible um, uh, challenges uh, and, and morbidity uh, with um, with black and brown communities, uh, the intersectionality of, of, of poverty uh, and, and and race and a disproportionate representation of people of color uh, in uh, jobs that might be deemed essential. Um, amazingly, some of those that, based on many of our future work studies, may indeed uh, be phased out over time due to automation and AI and advanced machine learning. Right now, a number of those employees uh, and, and individuals and citizens are on the front line. And I say citizens, I'm actually also talking about those who may not be citizens, uh, just um, uh, uh, folks who are, who are here and working to sustain uh, the, 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 the country that we all uh, live in. We have some incredible uh, challenges, uh, but I remain convinced that we have the right people on the line right now um, to uh, discuss. Taylor, I will ask to discuss and, and, and help us go forward. Uh, I, I will ask Taylor, uh, let's um, make sure we circulate the list, um, uh, maybe on the invite, but I want everyone to know who's on the call. Uh, we have, uh, of course, representatives, as I mentioned, elected officials, DHEC, uh, we have uh, Prisma, uh, we have, um, uh, Black Greek letter organizations, um, uh, Divine Nine organizations, a number of other professional groups and, and folks who are just doing amazing work uh, all across the community from um, our universities and Columbia College, um, um, uh, Cassie Alia and Serving Connect, just a, a number of really good uh, folks. So I want to make sure we have the, uh, the, the entire, um, of course, Eau Claire Health Cooperative, um, um, always doing amazing work as well. So uh, let's move forward. We'll quickly go over uh, the, the goals here. This is these are the uh, uh, the, the the musings of a of a um, uh, of a of a, of a uh, 
public policy leader and, 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 and uh, not a public health professional. So certainly wanna make sure that uh, uh, we know this is a living list and being able to dial down and get a bit deeper. Uh, I wanna make sure that um, as we get into the discussion period, uh, that we have a chance to dig deeper, but obviously just making sure that everyone who needs access uh, to care can get it. Uh, dealing with some of the, um, uh, the challenges around, around spatial mismatch and, and logistics and having people actually get to services, make sure we're able to access those services uh, in their neighborhoods, something I know we also have the NAACP and the Columbia Urban League and their presence on, on, on the phone too, something that's been a very important, in uh, all the noise uh, that, that we have out there on, on cable TV and, and, and folks who have different opinions, some um, uh, maybe uh, even poorly informed opinions, we wanna make sure people have access to good, solid, public health, data-driven, compassionate information that helps them keep themselves safe and their families safe. So access to information, I want to make, uh, we want to make sure that, um, that uh, a lot of our low wage essential employees have access to PPE, uh, which is um, uh, a challenge across the board, but a particular focus of, of this effort. And then uh, again, make sure we're building really uh, true and solid intergovernmental and intersectoral capacity, really uh, breaking down the silos that have different levels of government, our public health professionals, our, our, our health system, our, our nonprofits, everyone really working together towards some, uh, some solid, uh, definable goals, uh, measurable, achievable, results oriented, clear as to who has what responsibilities, really believe we can get something done here. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna stop there and, and again, just say um, uh, I'm thankful uh, to live in a community with each and every one of you um, helping uh, lead. Uh, the uh, agenda has us um, uh, going to, uh, um, um, Maya Reese, we're, we're, we're fortunate that we have uh, both um, um, Maya Reese and, and we have Dr. Linda Bell um, uh, on, on the line uh, from, from DHEC. And uh, ladies, I'll, I'll let you determine who's going who's to present uh, first. I'm sure you, di you dialogue and let's, um, let's, let's jump into just sharing some information with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And um, if, Myra, can you, can you hear me? Make sure so, you, have to, you have to self unmute. Everyone was muted initially. So you have, you have to self unmute. Uh, hey, Myra. There you go. Good morning, Myra. Good morning. Good morning. Let me know how you'd like to handle it. You want me to go first? Yes, ma'am. Okay, mm -hmm. sure. That's right. uh, thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to participate. I have had a potential conflict with this, so I apologize for the last minute notice about my availability. We were able to shorten a previous call. And um, I, I'll be uh, giving just a brief update about our COVID-19 data, but um, I'm, I'm really encouraged about this kind of meeting because um, it is my hope that if anything good can come of this COVID-19 pandemic, it is that um, this will draw attention to some chronic problems with health disparities and um, social determinants of health that uh, will draw attention from many who may not have already been aware of these issues. And so for the long term, there, there may be some things that we can address uh, to fix some, uh, some chronic problems that are really highlighting this issue with the occurrence of COVID-19. Um, so people are always interested in the updates on the data and I can report that as of yesterday, we have 161 new cases of COVID-19 reported to DHEC, which brings the total of the number of people who have tested positive for the disease in South Carolina to um, 4,917. And we have experienced 150 deaths in South Carolina in individuals who were infected with the virus. And we, as Mayor, you've said, we're uh, recognizing that some groups are affected at a higher rate, particularly African Americans. I think you've already stated this, that they make up um, an estimated 27% of the population, but they comprise 36% of the cases that we've identified and 57% of the deaths. Um, 
We're recognizing that the reasons for this is that African Americans are more likely to have many of the um, underlying or other medical problems that are putting people and any flu that has severe complications that they become infected. So African Americans are more likely to have cardiovascular disease and diabetes and obesity and uh, underlying lung disease or um, asthma. These are all risk factors. So early on in the epidemic, it was being reported that individuals with those conditions were, were um, more likely to be hospitalized, more likely to die. So it should be no surprise that African-Americans who suffer disproportionately with those problems would be disproportionately affected by um, COVID-19. And as we began to get better at um, collecting the specific demographics around our case reports, that became evident. Um, it should have been no surprise. Um, the other issue that you've mentioned is, is the underlying reason that African Americans are more likely to have these conditions has upstream to do with the fact that they are more likely to have limited access to care and um, limited access to coverage. So um, controlling those chronic health conditions is important to prevent them from suffering the consequences of um, those complications. And that's the long-term effect that I'm addressing with these health disparities. We recognize the critical need to address these inequities and we're making a concerted effort to, um, to communicate prevention messages surrounding the COVID-19 experience to better reach communities of color about the risks and things that they can do to um, prevent from being at increased risk from exposure. Uh, we recognize that African Americans and other people of color are not at increased risk for exposure, they're at increased risk for complications should they become infected. So our efforts to communicate in all the communities about what we need to do for social distancing, uh, very care carefully observing um, hygiene practices, environmental cleaning, uh, the use of masks in public, and, and most importantly, to um, particularly in our communities to discourage social gatherings, non-essential activities, to make sure that people understand that as we're watching the data, if we begin to see those curves go down that everybody's looking for, we don't want people to become too complacent and begin participating in activities that we still know are risky because despite what the data tells us, until we um, are able to uh, make sure that we're testing adequately in all communities, there continues to be unrecognized cases in the community. So we all continue to be at risk of exposure. And uh, so now is not the time to, um, to relax those restrictions as we, um, as we all want to, um, to boost the economy and we want economic recovery, we wanna do that safely so that when there is the, rela the relaxation of allowed activities and retail settings and things like that, we want everyone to be aware that as they uh, engage in those activities, pay attention to what is essential for food, for um, medications, uh, essential shopping, that this is not the time to, um, to loosen all restrictions. So other non-essential activities, community gatherings, church services, and all those things, it's still very important that we maintain social distancing, that we wear masks, uh, because we're not in, by any means on the downward side of the curve. Um, we are uh, continuing to communicate those messages, and we're also partnering with environmental justice advocates to raise awareness. Uh, we'll be hosting a briefing with them later on today, and we're um, garnering new partnerships with the Commission for Minority Affairs that has uh, deep roots across the state to help many populations, including uh, those of color. Um, I wanna highlight that there's a lot of attention to this flattening of the curve and this, the projections, where will we be? Um, people very much want to know about um, perhaps a date on the calendar in the, uh, in, um, in the future when we can safely relax these um, restrictions. And, and we simply don't know that. I mean, what I'm telling people is that the, the, uh, the virus doesn't understand the calendar. So we can't pick dates in the future when it will be safe to participate in certain activities. We have to continue to monitor the data. And when we see not this plateau, but when we see a, um, 
a significant decline in cases that is sustained, that lasts, that, that we're sure is, um, that there's a decline in activity that's lasted for about 14 days, that's the incubation period for the disease, that it's not until we see that and that we are um, reassured that we're adequately testing in the community to identify cases that we can uh, pick a date in the future from that point where we see sustained uh, a decline in disease transmission. We're not looking for getting to zero because I, I believe that we are gonna have to get used to some level of transmission in the community and recognize that we may see upsurges as we move into the fall, but we don't wanna see a rebound effect because we have um, relaxed restrictions too soon or that people aren't paying attention to the need to continue those, um, those restrictions. So um, as we work to flatten the curve, we uh, also wanna be mindful of the fact that we're trying to increase access to care in communities. So we will be testing more and we may see numbers in fact go up. And we have to pay attention to the volume of testing that we're performing because if cases go up, but we see that we are testing far more people, then that's an expected finding. If we see a leveling off in the volume of tests performed, but cases are going up, that would be a concern that um, these are, this is a true increase in disease activity because we are not being as effective as we have been at social distancing. So all of the projections uh, where we are in the future are dependent on us maintaining uh, these effective uh, social distancing measures as we relax restrictions. There has to be a careful balance there. And so with that, Mayor, uh, those are some highlights that, um, that I would like people to be aware of. And I, I will just close with saying that um, I hope all of these efforts as we look at COVID-19 and controlling that for the short term is that we're really looking at the long term, the social determinants of health for education, access to care. All of those are contributors to what put communities of color in the position now to have this, um, this health disparity. And we've seen many other health disparities that these efforts will um, help us address the occurrence of HIV and all these other factors in, um, in communities of color. So thank you for the opportunity to participate. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Thank you, Joe. Ms. Reese. Yes, sir. Can you hear me, Mayor Benjamin? Yeah, perfectly. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good morning. And good morning, everyone. And I just want to thank you again, Mayor, for your leadership and for really bringing a very impressive line of leaders, community leaders, and other partners for us to work together on this huge challenge we have ahead of us and what we're experiencing, but also trying to look for those opportunities and looking for innovative ways that we can assist our communities. And I, I do wanna recognize that, that we are really only one of three agencies that have their health, their state's health agency combined with environmental agency. And I think at times like this, it's really going to benefit our communities in some of the things that we can come up together with from a health perspective and an environmental perspective. And it's a true honor for me to work with Dr. Bell and our public health warriors and, um, and just um, looking forward to uh, rolling up our sleeves with the partners that you brought to the table as well. Two main buckets that we're focused on right now is certainly we're staying connected with our regulated businesses and our regulated entities like our drinking water and wastewater facilities. Um, we know that um, our communities are very concerned about COVID, have a lot of questions. Um, and at, this, at a time like this, we don't want them to be concerned about the safety of their drinking water and, and the services like their wastewater. Also food safety in the restaurants. Um, we are, you know, we regulate re restaurants and we are identifying certain areas of the, of the state where we have um, uh, areas where we know we have health disparity. We have communities who are at higher risk of vulnerability from COVID and from other issues. And we're identifying those hot spots and, and getting down to the grassroots level, uh, level with some of our community leaders and, and talking about these type things. You know, how do you, 
um, when you go to the grocery store, um, or there's there's some things that you can do to minimize your risk of, of infection. And are those grocery stores following best practices and guidances as far as social distancing and, and other things? And so another connection we have with businesses is um, there's a there's so just a huge wealth of information out there. Um, CDC provides a lot of guidances to to businesses um, from a workforce protection standpoint. And of course, every business is different, and they want to talk to people about the CDC guidance. You know, um, how can we protect our our workers? Because if we want to protect our businesses, we need to protect protect our workers. And, and, and we, we're getting calls from those businesses and we're getting calls from folks that work in those businesses. And we have some uh, folks that um, are trying to keep up with the CDC uh, business guidance that continues to be updated almost on a daily basis because we learn something new every day about COVID and we learn new strategies and new technologies that actually help reduce the risk and we just got to make sure we capture that information. And then I will say the second bucket, which is the most important to me, something I'm very um, passionate is about, is that we've established an environmental justice advisory hub uh, in our state. We've identified some leaders who are very passionate about working with us and other partners to, to address environmental equity issues. And um, we're just working hand in hand with them. As Dr. Bell mentioned, um, she's going to be talking to those leaders this, this afternoon, this afternoon, um, because we really feel that an informed community is a protected community. And there are trusted messengers out there and the, including the faith-based community leaders and our environmental justice leaders and leaders like yourself, Mayor Benjamin, that we just want to make sure that you have the, the resources and the messages you need to help us work with the communities to minimize the risk. And so um, with that, I just want to say that we are very much looking forward uh, to supporting your effort and partnering with other folks and community groups um, that are really all uh, committed to working together. We greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, uh, Myra and, and uh, Linda and Dr. Bell for uh, uh, your leadership here. And I, again, I wanna make sure, usually Taylor's are a couple of steps ahead of me. Let's make sure we share um, uh, connection information so that everyone uh, can potentially receive all the information that uh, that that um, these two fantastic uh, leaders have already shared. Let's make sure whatever we can socialize, let's be sure to do it. Uh, um, my pleasure to, to call my friend uh, Vince Ford from Prisma Health. Um, Vince has been working on on these issues of uh, of uh, access to quality healthcare and different uh, roles for as long as uh, we've, we've had a pleasure of knowing each other. And, and Vince, you might give us an update from Prisma, brother. Yeah, thank you, uh, brother mayor, and to members of the city council and other elected officials. Thank you all for your leadership. And uh, I echo the sentiments of uh, the two previous speakers about thanking uh, you, uh, you city council and others in this community for uh, working together. Um, on behalf of Mr. O'Hala um, and other members of the Prisma Health Leadership Team, who obviously we're on the front lines of, um, of working um, with this community on, um, on these issues. I want to start by applauding our first responders, police and fire department about, um, about uh, um, they're doing, a, they're currently doing a parade around Richland and uh, Baptist thanking um, those doctors and nurses and other professionals for their work around the clock. Um, so you may hear sirens in the background. They started at Richland and they're gonna work their way to Baptist. And so we appreciate that. I think my presentation um, I'll use, if you'll put the presentation up. Uh, Dr. Dr. Bell did a great job of framing, um, I think why um, we are seeing health disparities around the state and uh, and the country um, is those other we believe those other prevailing issues that we're going to have to continue to work on post uh, COVID-19 uh, as well. Those issues like obesity and diabetes and and heart disease and other issues are 
or concern and, uh, and, uh, and the things that we need to work on. She also mentioned the social determinants of health. Uh, we're hard working on those issues. And what, for people who may not understand what that means, that means that we believe that there's some other conditions, some other issues that affect a person's health and well being, like food. I received a call this morning uh, from our Latino brothers and sisters that they may not uh, have adequate food. And so we're starting to work on that issue. Um, and so housing is a key issue, uh, medication. So uh, those are the issues. You see a chart in front of you, Mr. O'Hallow shared this chart with some um, leaders uh, within the week. And, um, and this is in the Midlands market. We're tracking this. And as you can see, this is dated through uh, 420, uh, uh, the 20th of this month. And I'll just run through this chart right quick, um, Brother Mayor. If you look um, uh, on the left side of the chart, it's showing the African-American population. And on the right side is showing the white population. Um, you look at the, the legend at the bottom of that, the blue, the blue bar represents the total population. Um, and so if you look at the exact left bar uh, where it says 38.5, that's the percentage of African-Americans in the Midlands area. Um, and then if you go all the way over to the, the second set of bars, you'll see that it's 55.2% uh, of our population is the white community. Uh, this does not show the Latino or other communities, but black and white. And then the, the orange bar shows the number of tests that have been provided. And if you look at the bottom of that, it says 3301, which will show the same in the white population, 3301, that's total testing. And as you can see, 1,298 African-Americans um, have been tested as compared to 16, 16 of white. But then as we start to get into, I think some of the issues that wanna be, uh, you all wanna discuss, the number of positives, that's the green bar. As you can see, 19.2% of African-Americans out of that population that have tested, tested positive um, as compared to 8.2% of the white community. Um, and then um, of those that have tested positive, the, the percentage that was admitted, 42.8% were admitted of African-Americans and 31.3% of, of our white community. And then unfortunately uh, deceased is uh, 23% compared to 28%. Um, those are just some of the numbers as of this week. Uh, it has changed a little bit, but not much. Um, and some other things that we're working on, um, Dr. Bell, I think did a great job of talking about some of the things that are going on or needed. We're starting to expand the base of testing into certain communities and particularly in our rural areas and other uh, communities. Uh, we're looking at uh, standing up a few more testing opportunities. Um, we're working with uh, Children's Hospital to actually do visits to um, homes um, to um, check on some children that are high risk or high need. Uh, we have been working with our, our shelters uh, with the leadership of the United Way, with Sarah Fawcett and Jennifer Moore, um, and working with Craig Curry and, uh, and other community-based organizations, those shelters. So if someone uh, presents the, that has a temperature or a positive, we want to set up a tier one and tier two facility where we can isolate those populations. Um, and so that work has been going on. We've also working with our schools um, and set up an opportunity that if a child uh, or a family member has some uh, non-urgent uh, healthcare issue that they could tap into a telehealth process um, and receive services uh, through telehealth, as well as the number of telehealth services are increasing overall in general um, with that, that Prisma Health is working on. So those are just some of the things that are going on um, from Prisma perspective. Um, we wanna thank everyone um, for your support of healthcare providers. Um, one of the things that I did, I forgot to mention is we're also working um, and we think uh, the emergency childcare is important. So we're working with the Y Boys and Girls Clubs um, and the school districts to set up emergency childcare for uh, Prisma Health team members, as well as first responders, children as well. So I'll stop right there, Brother Mayor, and answer any questions that anyone might have. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Vince. And we're gonna um, we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, roll on through the uh, uh, agenda. Have a brief presentation from Melissa Lindler. We don't we don't speak as much about the economic impact on small businesses and the like. So I do want her to touch on some of the work that um, 
that she's been able to do uh, with our, our business revitalization programs. And I know that's being complimented by the great work that's happening at the county as well. And then we're gonna jump into an open discussion period. So some of you who don't, like some, like several of us, some of you I see on, on Zoom now and I've never seen, seen us uh, together in the community. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you're not as familiar with Zoom, you can um, obviously also go up to the, uh, um, the, the, the more uh, button and, 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 and tap into the, the chat rooms uh, uh, too. So you can see uh, some questions already being asked and, and answered uh, uh, in there. Dr. Kremlin asked one that um, uh, Dr. Bell responded to. And then once we get into open discussion, we're gonna ask folks to, um, uh, to just maybe ra ra raise their hands so we can maybe get through some of the questions. Uh, in an orderly fashion, see how, how we can how we can manage it. I think we can we can get through it. Um, Melissa, can you give us a quick one? Melissa Lindler, Director Office of Business Opportunities. Melissa, is your mic open? All right, there you go. Melissa, you're unmuted. Am I unmuted now? Thank you. Uh, all yours, Melissa. Okay, thank you. Can you see the presentation? Just want to yes. make sure. Yes, okay. ma'am. Great. Um, I just want to thank council and, and the manager for the foresight they had to invest in our small businesses um, on the onset before we actually had any federal funding coming down the pipe or before there were any announcements that were made, they were ready. Um, and had the staff ready and prepared to help support our small businesses during this very, very fragile time. On March 20th, as part of our Resilient Columbia Economic Sustainability Plan, uh, the council actually invested 1.5 million into the Small Business Stabilization Program. And uh, in that program, we have uh, the Small Business Stabilization Forgivable Loan Program at $1 million. And what I wanna share with you this morning is, you know, not only the 220 applicants that we actually were able to award funding to, but also the distribution of those funds and how they went out into the community. We were trying to be fair, we were trying to be equitable, and we also want to make sure that we got the, the funds out on the streets as soon as possible because we knew that their sustainability and their ability to uh, secure additional funding down the line re would re result in um, them closing if we didn't actually get that money to them. So I just wanna briefly share with you some of the highlights of some of the funds that were received and where we are. Um, again, we had, we made 220 awards to our small business community, um, totaling $999,750. So our entire $1 million that were allocated to this program have been fully uh, committed for the most part. When we're looking at the awards that went by business type, that's something I really want to share because it was so diverse. Um, of course, we knew from the survey that we did prior to actually doing our application for our SBSF program, that a number of needs um, in our community were coming from our restaurants and our professional services and the healthcare and retail industry, as well as our barbie, um, barber shops and beauty salons. You can tell in this slide right here that majority, Melissa, yes. Melissa, is there a way you can launch the PowerPoint so people can see uh -oh. the- uh, see I tried this? to and it didn't- It wouldn't play right? Is okay. that- There you go. You there all see go. it now? Okay, yeah. perfect. I'm sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> And, okay, let me go back. So what I wanna share with you is if you look, um, the restaurants actually received the most of our funding. Um, they're the most uh, applicants that actually submitted applications at, <clears throat> excuse me, 15.5% of the 220. Professional services, 11.4% and um, retail at 10.9%. We also had a number of other businesses that were not part of our application that actually submitted, or at least the business type wasn't listed. And those businesses were, um, I'll just show all this to you and I won't read over it, but you just see the diversity of, and the need of so many of our businesses, especially our small businesses um, here in Columbia that needed this assistance. It was very diverse. So when we looked at the length of time awardees were in business, most of the respondents of the 220 have been in business for more than 10 years at 45.5%. 
Um, and the next largest number, our longest time that they had been in business was three to five years at 20.5%. All right. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not sure what happened to the PowerPoint. Hold on a second. Just went dead. Okay. Okay, and the largest uh, dollar amount um, that we made, our loans that we made, the forgivable loans that we made, range from $1,000 to $8,000. And the average award that was made was $4,500. And the award that was made most frequently was $5,000. And I'm happy to say that the bulk of our funds that were made or the bulk of the awards that were made range or fell within the $2,001 to $4,000 range at 36.8%. And um, 34.1% were made at the $5,001 to $8,000 range. So these were substantial awards that went out to our small businesses. And most of our respondents um, were small businesses with employees five or below, which meant that these this funding really, really did help them um, tremendously because of their low operating costs and will at least sustain them for at least a month. Number of employees prior to versus after um, COVID-19. As you can tell from the chart, uh, before uh, COVID-19, only seven of our applicants had zero employees. So they were probably like just contractors. And one um, employee, only 28 uh, of our sub recipients, of our recipients actually had uh, one employee at 12.7%. Compare that to after COVID-19, of the applicants that submitted applications, 47 of them at 21.4% now have zero employees. They had to let a lot of people go. Um, one, one employee, 22.3% uh, or 49 of them. And when you look at or compare 21 or more employees prior to COVID and after COVID, Prior to COVID, we had 11.4% of the 220 that had 21 or more employees. After COVID, we only had seven at 3.2% that had 21 or more employees. Now, this is something that's, that you will probably find very in interesting as well. Um, again, we want to make sure that we're fair. We want to make sure that we serve our most vulnerable uh, small business community that may or may not have access to funding. So this funding um, really was it went at minorities and minority veterans at 83 of the 220 awardees actually received funding for us. That was actually 37.7% of our not applicable or not applicable veterans. That's more, mostly our white males. That was at 96 point, I'm sorry, it was 96 employees at 46.6, 43.6%. Um, Non-minority women, um, 41 of the 220 applicants um, fell into that category at 18.6%. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, yes, sir. No, go ahead. I want to make sure we, we, we um, wrap pretty soon because, but, but those okay. two charts, but those two charts are the ones that were particularly, I think, important yes, because we really want to make sure that uh, folks and get the, the focus on equity and distribution and, and geographic distrib distribution of, of, of the loan. Okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. So here you can see that our minority and minority veterans receive 40.8% or $408,000. Um, Non-minority women, 16.8% or $168,150. And how they're using the funds, and I'll stop here, Mayor. Um, we have most of the money actually is being used for payroll expenses as well as business rent and lease. Uh, business lease and rent, 32.5% and payroll costs, 31.5%. Um, thankfully, uh, thanks to the mayor and council, they have actually allocated another 400,000 to this program. And with that, we'll be able to fund additional applicants um, that are already in our portal. This time we will be considering and looking at whether or not you have received SBA funding. That's not something that we looked at before because at that time the SBA funding really wasn't available. So we're going to use this money to make sure that those applicants that are in the system that do not have access to SBA funding or other types of public funding that they will be able to benefit from this program. So we now have a total investment of 1.4 million in our stabilization forgivable loan program. Thank you.
No, no, thank, thank you, Melissa. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your work on this. And thank you to council uh, for an incredible work uh, supporting um, uh, Teresa and her entire team. We know that uh, obviously the, the, the challenges uh, that African-American businesses and other small minority-owned businesses have in, in, in just a normal economy are, are real. And certainly as we talk about when and how we're gonna re-enter uh, society and start doing business as normal. Uh, that this is, a, this is just an issue that's top of mind for so many of us. Um, we're gonna um, shift into a, just a period of open uh, discussion. I did wanna also recognize on the phone, we have representatives from our, our two instructor by colleges, Atlantic and Allen University. Uh, we have um, the leadership from Links, from Sigma Phi Phi, a fraternity from the Congaree Medical and Dental and Pharmaceutical Association, President of the Medical, uh, Medical Association, Optus Bank, and so, and so many others. Uh, so we got a really good group of, uh, of, um, of, of do-getters uh, and people who've been making some amazing um, uh, uh, contributions. Um, I'm gonna um, um, first uh, maybe recognize uh, Dr. Bill Tate. Uh, Dr. Tate uh, is um, incoming, uh, can't get here soon enough. Uh, new Executive Vice President and Provost of the University of South Carolina. Um, we'll have, I guess have a, another epidemiologist in, in South Carolina uh, at that time. Dr. Tate, you want to make some comments? Thank you for the introduction. And also, um, from my perch here in St. Louis, I've observed uh, your efforts, uh, Mr. Mayor, and that of uh, Dr. Bell reading uh, her uh, uh, speeches and conversations with the public and want to commend you for doing an outstanding job. I think you set a great example for the rest of the metropolitan areas uh, in the United States. So um, thank you for doing that. Um, I will um, just add uh, very briefly, um, as I think about this topic of disparities, um, it requires our very best in order to uh, change and turn the tide with this. The pandemic only uh, showed the chasms that exist in our community. And as way of backdrop, I use that term best um, to describe exactly what we're going to have to intervene on. Um, B, for biological issues, uh, as was laid out, um, the underlying conditions that exist in our community are very important. Uh, e being the environmental issues that exist. Um, those are hugely important structural so issues sorry. as well. So and um, I'm sorry. Conditions. I'm so sorry. Oh, wait. Here. Yeah. We're good. Um, but my, my bottom line is uh, you're doing a great job, but I, I, I think that um, I look forward to being there with you for the next phase of uh, what happens during this process. I, obviously, you're trying to stabilize or triage the situation. And uh, I look forward to the evaluation that happens after the triage stage and the reallocation so that we can intervene on um, this best issue, you know, all of the, those factors that are impacting the lives of, of folks there. So I wish you the absolute best and uh, I'll be there soon. So get this right because I'm bringing my family. And, that, and I think that's how people need to look at it. Um, you need to get it right so that folks will want to be there and want to um, invest their time and energy and stay in that community in a safe fashion. So uh, thank you for what you're doing. And, um, and, I, and I really wanna say this in a heartfelt way. I could say to my family, we could go to, to the Columbia area because what's happening there. Um, I wouldn't just get up and go for a job uh, and put my family at risk. What you're doing there is outstanding and I really appreciate it. So thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Tate. So, so much work to do. And I, I'm, I'm glad you gave me a great segue. I was speaking to a, a colleague mayor in Texas uh, just uh, two days ago. And, um, and uh, obviously, Texas has some of, some of the same um, political winds that we, we tend to uh, work with here. And, and he told a reporter, he said, I'm not going to ask my city to do anything I wouldn't ask my family to do. And I think that's the way we all have to um, uh, approach this. And uh, um, and but obviously things won't just happen. It's going to take leaders uh, to to make it happen. Uh, 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 you can use the um, the opportunity to, to raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll, and I'll come to folks in the order. Um, I think Taylor just sent a, a, a text out about how to raise your hand. I'm going to um, defer to Councilwoman Divine. I think she had um, a question. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my question um, is really for Dr. Bell and Mr. Ford. Uh, Dr. Bell mentioned about um, we'll be testing more, so we will likely see the numbers go up. And I'm just wondering, as far as the testing goes, we know that the testing criteria has been 
pretty strict and I am not sure with um, especially have needing to have a prescription from a doctor or symptoms if the testing in the minority community will happen at the level that we need. So my question really is, is the criteria going to be relaxed? And if not, if maybe there is a suggestion as far as the people on this call, what we might could do to help get more testing in minority communities, either through utilizing Cometa Health or Prison yeah. Health, either yeah. Prison Health yeah. Yeah. Unit or yeah. else so that we can get more into the community to test minority communities that don't have symptoms and um, may not have access to a primary care physician. Yes, Tamika, thank you for asking that question, um, making sure I'm unmuted. Um, the reason that we had the um, original recommendations to prioritize testing was because of the limitations in testing supplies and the chemical reagents that the labs use to get the test results out. So that now that the um, test supplies, the swabs and the um, transport tubes are more widely available and that the, um, the issue with the shortages of the chemical reagents has been addressed, we uh, have just uh, in the last day or so, or just recently sent out another health alert from DHEC. This is through our health alert network that goes out to healthcare providers in South Carolina, explaining that um, we are no longer looking at prioritizing testing for those who are most severely ill. We were focusing on uh, individuals who were hospitalized and the healthcare workers because we didn't have enough tests to go around. So now um, we're doing that, asking providers to um, expand testing for individuals in the community who have symptoms. Uh, so that, that is one of the means that we're looking at to expand testing. I, I do wanna comment that it is still though for people who uh, have symptoms, I maybe I can address separately. We're getting a lot of questions about testing people without symptoms to make decisions about return to work and that's not recommended. But the second part of having providers expand testing is to make sure that the individuals who need it have access to it. So we have, um, we've recently surveyed our um, um, rural health providers and our community health centers through the South Carolina Office of Rural Health and through the South Carolina Primary Health Care Association to find out which of those providers are currently offering testing, which laboratory that they're using. Um, our public health laboratory does not have a backlog. We have more capacity to perform tests than is currently being used. And our turnaround time in the public health lab is shorter than it is for some of the private reference labs. So for example, the DHEC lab can turn around a test result within 24 to 48 hours. And um, some of the private labs, we are getting test results back five to seven and, and sometimes even more days after the test is performed. And, it, as a, and as an aside, it's also information like that that creates those bumps in the curve. So we may get results back from a lab that has held on to test results for as much as a week, they send them in in a batch, and then we see a big jump in the curve. That doesn't mean that's new disease activity. It means we're detecting cases that were tested a week or so ago. Um, but to go back to the access to testing, we um, have also asked healthcare providers in rural settings and community health centers, if you're not currently testing, what are your issues? One of those was that they did not have adequate availability of personal protective equipment that the healthcare workers need to wear when they're collecting samples. So we're trying to address that to make sure they have adequate personal protective equipment, or this is what we call PPE. Um, there are some issues with reimbursement for medical services. Um, there are uh, testing sites that are being uh, made available, but individuals have to have access, or don't have to have access, but the access to telemedicine to allow people to remotely access a healthcare provider and then be referred to a testing site. As most of you on this call know, can be an issue if um, individuals in rural areas don't have access to the internet. So we're trying to address whether or not they can get access to a healthcare provider by phone instead of with a video contact. And um, the other issue is um, if there are um, any other barriers that we are not aware of that, um, that we're trying to address. So to make sure they have PPE, adequate testing supplies, that they um, are 
testing sites are, are stood up in rural locations where people with transportation issues can reach them. And those are um, among the things that we're trying to address to increase testing in, um, in areas where it doesn't currently exist. And if we're successful in doing that and we test more people, we may see case rates go up, but that would represent people that we previously just had, had not detected, but there is a still uh, unrecognized transmission in the community. So Tamika, I hope that that answers most of your questions. Uh, it, it certainly does. It, it, it does, and I was just wondering, Vince, are, we, are you guys using your mobile unit to get into some of those um, hard to access areas? Well, I think Dr. Bell did an, I, I think Dr. Bell did an excellent job of, of framing what's going to be happening. So we will be taking the mobile unit out. Um, a, we won't necessarily provide the test on the unit, um, but we'll uh, stand the mobile unit up and take it around from site to site and, uh, and provide uh, either testing through drive through or walk up um, as uh, Dr. Uh, Bell has uh, talked about. We will be taking the mobile unit. In fact, the mobile unit is out almost every day now particularly going to some hard to reach areas for other types of services. We would definitely use it for, um, for uh, the testing process as well. Um, okay, Councilwoman Devine, let me, let me um, just uh, very quickly, let's, um, I think understanding um, what, what DHEC is, is gonna do, uh, what uh, Prisma is gonna do and um, getting the strategy as to how they're gonna go forward and then finding ways in which we might be able to support and, and complement that work and maybe address some areas. I know that just based on, on the geography and the interest level and, and the focus of different folks on this call, uh, just understanding where everyone's going, we might be able to, to, to fill in some gaps very thoughtfully and creatively and, um, and again, a, um, um, a multi-jurisdictional approach. We, we're, we're also fortunate, of course, enough on this call just to have um, um, Senator um, John Scott and uh, Representatives uh, Canberra Garvin and, and Avery Thigpen, who um, who are also uh, catalyzing some activity. I know um, uh, uh, with the faith community, uh, Senator Scott has, has shown some some great leadership there. Continues to in that area. I know that Representatives Garvin and um, and Big Pen have, have been very direct about trying to meet this needs in their dialogues uh, with the governor's office as a Senator Scott. So I think I think getting a sense as to strategically and maybe where these new uh, federal resources might be going, we ought to be able to as a group um, um, figure out how we can meet some unmet needs out there. Understanding that the more testing we may have, uh, the better. Does see your hand, um, um, Councilman Davis? You take it. You take the mute off. Take your mute off, Councilman. Okay, we got good. Yes, sir. Um, let me say first. I think the uh, your your last comment and <clears throat> excuse me, Vince's comment right now is, is spot on. Everything I've been uh, been reading and looking at and trying to understand. I think, like most people, how did we get to this point? And with the number of entities that we say we do have in, in the immediate area and those that are attempting to serve the rural area. It's still a question of how is it that somehow we've missed the folks that are out there, one that have the, the preconditions and, and that have, in a number of cases, you have you know the misdiagnosis and, and uh, that sort of thing. So the, I agree that we have to figure out a way to, to really put our fingers on those people that need the services, have the, and it's, in my mind, I just don't understand why is it that that many people um, have not been receiving the services. And, and the service providers, I think, have opportunities to, to discover as well um, people they serve who have those underlying conditions. And so, um, I think if we could be more diligent in beating the bushes, we all know that that um, economics have come into play, and and um, and historically, um, where people work, the types of work they do, and and income also has sort of put them on the bubble, on the target on the bullseye, but for some reason, there have been no 
discoveries, timely discoveries of their health situation. So therefore our numbers are high, but that if we have to, I think, continue to look at the history of how African-Americans got to this point. Why and systemically, how do we, how do we fight that battle? Sure. Uh, we still have to deal with some of the systemic things that have uh, gotten us to this point. And so therefore you have folks that are not, not participating somehow systemically we have not touched them and so they are the they are the ca casualties the main casualties of the pandemic amen amen i know we, we're, we're going to lose dr bell in a second uh dr bell did you have a, a final word um before before you uh left? um no not really i mean only to uh thank you again and and thank this group that's convened to address these chronic issues and i you know i'm happy to take if there are any um, final questions for me and if not at this time um I, i'm happy for you know people to reach me through the um, email address that you're providing and i'll uh, respond to any questions uh, oh yeah and we'll be and we'll be meeting um again um, um pete uh petra Pietra, i'm sorry if i if i got the pronunciation of your name wrong if uh if you, I'm not sure if your question is for Dr. Bell. If it is, you might be able to get a last question to her. If it's more general, um, feel free to jump in right now. Hi, um, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much um, for um, coordinating this call. Very important, and it's very inspiring to see all of our community partners um, on this phone call um, who really are um, concerned about our community and our state as a whole. Um, so thank you everybody for your participation. Uh, for Dr. Bell, I don't particularly have a question, but I did want to share really quickly. I know that we are on some limited, limited time, but wanted to provide a little bit um, of information relative to community health centers, which um, I represent Eau Claire Cooperative Health Centers or Cooperative Health. And I wanted to share with my community partners here um, on the call today that um, we understand that there is a large population who truly rely on the services that we provide. Um, and so for us, it was ensuring that we keep our operations open Monday through Friday. Um, pharmacy, so our, our open um, medications are very, very important for our marginalized communities. Um, I also want to share that we have launched um, drive-through testing in four rural areas throughout the Midlands of South Carolina. Um, we have launched our mobile unit. We are in Hopkins, Little Mountain, um, Pelion and Winsboro, so Fairfield County. So please, um, please note that and share with anybody that you may be talking with. Um, we have the information that's up on our website. We do have a call center that we set up. Um, we understand that fear is a very large um, determinator in, in um, our communities and we are trying to break down that barrier and know that we are there for, for them, we are here for you. I also have my colleague, Dr. Schleter, who can speak on the clinical perspective um, and what we've experienced over the past couple of weeks uh, with the progression of COVID-19. Thank you, Pietra. So again, thank everybody for what you're doing here at Cooperative Health, just as Pietra shared. We are in all parts of the Midlands, Newberry, Fairfield, Richland and Lexington County. All of our offices, um, for the most part, are open for business. We have also initiated, as uh, Mr. Ford shared, about virtual visits, telephone-based visits, video-based visits, and then as well with the uh, COVID-19 testing. And so I um, just wanted to share with you guys that we are here as a cooperative um, partner and community partner, and as well with our relationship with uh, Transitions um, Homeless Shelter in, in town. So um, again, we'll just kind of turn it back over, but just again, wanted to let everybody know that we are here and we are invested in making sure that especially those minority communities who are um, impacted with um, the underlying healthcare conditions and chronic diseases, we are here to help them manage um, to the best of their ability in terms of partnering with, with patients in the community. Well, okay. Okay. Health Cooperative always does amazing work. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sita. Thank you, Ms. Cruz. Um, before the, 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 um, the, um, uh, Mayor, can I make one more comment? Um, oh, yeah. Sure. One about. more request? Please. So um, thank you so much, uh, um, Pietra and uh, Dr. Schleter. We w have been fantastic partners um, to us. For the information that you just mentioned about those new testing sites through the uh, Eau Claire facilities, 
the, um, we're getting a lot of questions from individuals about where testing is available and we're trying to keep the DHEC website available as a resource. If you could please provide that information um, to me, if you could also copy it to Warren Bolton, uh, then we can put that information about those testing sites. We're, as we learn more about uh, rural clinics that are providing these services, we wanna make sure that we're able to promote those locations. So please um, send me in an email what you just stated and we can get that up on our website. Absolutely, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, next up, Dr. Crumlin. You gotta make sure you get your mute up, Doc. Still muted. There you go. All right. Uh, greetings, Gloria, and good afternoon. Thank you so very much for inviting me and allowing me to ask a question. I'm fortunate in that my day job has allowed me to telework, but I'm very concerned about uh, the fact that as the economy has been shut down nationally, statewide, and on the city level, as we try to recover, you know, what are we going to do to look to try to make sure this is done in a safe manner? I'm particularly concerned about our small businesses. Um, as sort of a, a, a thought going forward, the thought should be no tests, no vaccine, stay home quarantine. Until you are able to test, and of course, a vaccine is a year and a half, two years away. Until you're able to test, ideally, individuals should stay home in quarantine. Um, and when the business is open, in theory, social distancing should still be in practice. And uh, maybe you can have clients come in and have their temperatures checked before they shop. So where I'm getting at is I'm just wondering um, if you any thought about how Prisma, DHEC, the mayor's office, or just things going forward in terms of how we can help to uh, get these businesses going back and get them, get them back on their feet in the uh, new social norm that we're going to be facing. Um, I'll, I'll touch um, very briefly on that. Um, obviously, some of the some of the um, work that Ms. Lindler just laid out, we're going to probably going to see more and more uh, innovation in that space. But yes, our, our focus really has to be on, um, on not just uh, reopening the economy, but how do we reopen a, a more pandemic resilient economy? Uh, how, how are we making sure that if we, if we, if we open, first of all, if you open businesses and, and consumer confidence is there, people are not coming out. Um, that's one thing, but, but also until we, uh, you know, um, get a vaccine and get antibody testing really um, um, up and reliable and accessible, we're going to have to adapt protocols from uh, other essential industries that help us do what we can to mitigate a risk and help our businesses be ready, as you, as you uh, mentioned. And that's probably going to be a, a, a strategy. And we've been playing with the idea I mentioned on council meeting the other day of, um, of uh, maybe even having a, 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 a certified, um, what was the term I used? I'm trying to think of a... Uh, uh, kind of a, almost like a good housekeeping seal of approval uh, that certain businesses that subscribe to these uh, types of practices, if I'm choosing between retailer A and retailer B as to where I'm going to uh, 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 go to shop for my family, and retailer A has decided that they're going to monitor every day uh, for clinical symptoms, that they're going to check daily temperatures of their em employees and maybe their patrons, uh, that if we can help make testing available, uh, that, that, that they will um, test their employees and realize that you probably um, for a significant period of time have to retest employees um, and, and prayerfully again repeat testing will be available um, that if you if you commit to ongoing uh, workplace safety measures uh, including social distancing when it's available and when it's not available and appropriate use of, of, of PPE uh, that that, you, that that business retailer a commits to enhanced disinfection of shared surfaces on a regular um, uh, basis and also to appropriate sick leave policies for employees. If I have to choose between going to retailer A who has agreed to those things and we help facilitate um, uh, a, a business getting from A to, a to B uh, uh, and retailer B says, no, I'm just gonna go and do what I wanna do. I'm gonna go to retailer A and I believe the cut that, that the uh, uh, 
that the, the public will also do the same thing. So, but I think it, 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 with all the noise out there, I think we have to make sure that we help employers and employees uh, adjust into what will probably be several new normals uh, with, with of course a, a focus on testing and even and as importantly as um, Dr. Bell mentioned, continued social distancing so that we can um, continue to keep people safe. So uh, that, that was a long answer, but that, that's one way we're gonna to try to approach this from the, from the city's uh, and I don't, and I don't want to, you know, wrap up the discussion. I mean, claim too much of the discussion, too much. But one other thing to just kind of think about, because I'm really concerned about things like our barber shops, you know, our small businesses like that, and all. And, and uh, it'll be interesting though, because we have Georgia right next door, and they're they're trying an interesting experiment. So who knows? Maybe we'll be able to um, learn some lessons from them. Thank you. Hopefully not too bad, but too too many bad lessons. Um, next Can I make up, one more comment before I sign off. Oh yeah, absolutely. Didn't know you're still here, Doc. That's absolutely. No, sorry, I just about to sign off, but um, I cert I agree with everything you said about the importance of the social distancing, those um, those protective measures for businesses to operate safely. I just want to make one point about the testing that has been mentioned. We we need to separate testing as a means of protection and prevention. Until, and, and you alluded to this, uh, Mayor, uh, actually until we have a test that establishes immunity, a test doesn't protect anyone. So we are getting lots of questions about people wanting to be tested to return to work. Testing is only indicated for return to work at this time for uh, healthcare providers who have been sick, and then we test them to make sure they've cleared the virus so that they can return to work. The problem with the test to return to work return to work for other people in the community is if we test you and you're negative, but you get exposed two or three days later and then you're positive, that you know a, a negative test doesn't help us in any way with making decisions about who can work. And that's why we have to observe that you know the masks, the social distancing and everything, because if you get a negative test, uh, the current test that we have available just says that you are currently infected. Now, if you get a negative test, that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that the current test does not um, establish that you're immune. So until there's a, a test for immunity and frankly, some way to certify that, that people, this has actually been discussed. Say you had some sort of a card or something like that and say, you know, I've tested with the antibody that shows protection. That's a test that doesn't exist yet. That's the kind of test we could use to help people return to work. So we do not want businesses to pursue testing their employees to make sure they can work because that it doesn't prevent exposure. They could subsequently become infected and a negative test at one point in time is not helpful. Um, so, um, and I, I just wanted to explain that to our business owners, a really important point because we're getting a lot of questions about that. And I'm gonna go ahead and sign off now. Thanks so much, everyone. All right, thank, thank you, Dr. Bell. I'm gonna take these in order. Let's get um, Chairman Livingston and then uh, Senator Scott and then uh, Dub Taylor and, uh, and Muhammad Salam in that order. Um, Mr. Chairman? Well, uh, <clears throat> well, I was about to say good morning, but uh, good afternoon. Let me just quickly say on behalf of Richmond County Council, my colleagues this morning, I'm thanking the mayor for your leadership. And I wanna thank everybody that's participating on the call as well. Um, County Council take this matter extremely serious. Uh, we put together a very extensive um, um, hardworking ad hoc committee to work on these items. <clears throat> uh, and, but what I want to make sure everybody's aware of this particular point, I apologize for my voice is a divorce there, <clears throat> is that the County Council have also put together an economic assistance program. And I'll take advantage of this opportunity to talk about that program briefly. That program primarily focuses on small business and economic relief. So we're talking about small businesses, we're focusing on food services, retail, art, entertainment, recreation in those areas. Um, and we want to make sure we take care of the true small business. And, that, and we're gratifying that group of businesses, for example, with one to five employees, that's a separate category. Then I think the second one is like six to 25, and then from six to 50. And I think we won't go, we're not going beyond that particular point. We're also going to have an economic relief program. Now the focus there is on food, food insecurity, for example, rent um, assistance, utility assistance, deal with health and hygiene and so forth with that, with that particular program. So we're gonna roll that out on, on this coming Monday. Uh, please make sure you attend to the various announcements that we'll have going out. 
as well as um, visit our website. That website is richlandcountysc.gov to take advantage of the opportunity we have for the community. Uh, and we'll continue to um, work with our partners uh, to reach the community. But again, make sure you inform individuals in the community about the rollout of our um, economic assistance program on this coming Monday. And again, uh, feel free to um, contact any of my colleagues and myself for any issue you might have a concern you may have regarding uh, this COVID virus and, and, and the impact of the role of Richard County's plan. Mr. Mayor, again, thank you for your leadership and thank everybody on the call. Thank, thank you um, so much, um, Mr. Chairman. I, I saw Senator Scott uh, had his hand raised, uh, but I, I don't see his picture right now. Uh, Senator, if you're still on, um, otherwise I'll, 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 I'll come back to you. All right. All right, then um, we're gonna go to uh, uh, Doug Taylor. Hey, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, thank you, Mayor, for your uh, leadership. I just wanted to uh, pose a question on possibly an idea. Um, you know, we've heard from our healthcare professionals who gave them wonderful uh, updates, but I think now is a wonderful time for us to partner with the higher education space, it's particularly our HBCUs, with trying to help educate as well as, uh, you know, test our youth. Uh, uh, at a better manner in which we are, you know, because some, you know, some misses out there that, you know, the young people cannot get it. It's just for the uh, older people, which we know the facts of that is the complete opposite of that. But I just think now is a probably a good time for um, health care and the education, higher education piece to partner and kind of target some of our, uh, our students um, now more than ever. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, um, one of the physicians are, are Prisma Eau Claire. I want to talk, and, and I'm not sure Dub, if you mentioned it, uh, Dub's a, a, a senior vice president at Allen University uh, here uh, in, in Columbia. Uh, opportunities to partner with um, our colleges. Pietra, maybe? There you go. You're, un you're unmuted now. Am I unmuted now? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. So um, absolutely, I think it's um, fantastic, Mr. Taylor, that you're bringing up um, a very important point um, about workforce development in our communities. And um, some of the uh, features at Cooperative Health, what we strive to do is partner with our local um, schools, such as um, Benedict Allen, um, as well as other schools that um, train or that have specific courses for um, those persons who are interested in the healthcare field. Um, I'd be more than happy maybe um, offline to discuss some of the initiatives that we have in place, but I'm very, very glad that you did touch on workforce development, um, specifically for um, community health centers. I think it's very important that we train up um, the talent that we have in our communities um, because sometimes community health is not for everybody. And um, we want to ensure that the persons that we um, um, have in our communities are, are um, truly aware of, of the work that we do because it truly, it is a passion of, of, of love. Um, but again, if you um, would like to talk more offline about some of the issues that we have on, um, in place, um, I'd be more than happy to go um, in depth. Again, we do have partnerships with, um, we've worked with Benedict Allen, USC, MUSC, um, South University. So we have a couple of contracts in place where we do work um, with their current student force. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Wow. Thank, thank, thanks to both of you. Uh, Mohammed Salam. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bittman, for hosting this call for us. As a representative of the community organizations, what are some things that um, our local organizations can be doing to support your efforts and other maybe organized efforts in the city. Um, I know so I was representing MPHC. I know we've committed to supporting Harvest Hope, and I know some other individual organizations are doing that as well as they have had an increase of need and support during this time. Well, what are some other efforts, organized efforts, just that local community organizations can be supporting you and your efforts during this time? 
Yeah, no, thank you. And, that, and that, that's what I'm thinking, um, and might get there towards the tail end, uh, maybe in our uh, wrap up um, and next steps. Uh, just, just, just watching the synergy here and some of the dialogue we've seen, you know, um, uh, with Ms. Cruz and, 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 and uh, Dr. Sue and Dr. Bell as, as a clear example of it. So many of you are already doing great work out there, and so many people want to do great work. Some may have a, a very specific focus geographic, um, certain neighborhoods, some, some communities that you may be already deeply involved in, like, like, like Cassie uh, and, and Dr. Burke and, uh, and Lauren and others. Uh, I'd, I'd love to get a, a, a very quick and comprehensive review, everyone replying back and compile them so we can share with everyone, this is what we're doing. Um, so we can, we, can, we can share that with the entire group. This is where our interest is. Um, and, and maybe even uh, this is where we know there are some specific needs. Uh, uh, deep dive in, even into Mr. Um, uh, Davis's comment and question uh, earlier. Uh, it, you know, it's pretty clear. We, we, we know, uh, working with our physicians, um, for example, we know what, uh, which of our uh, Colombians and, uh, and folks across the Midlands and, and what parts of town are, are already suffering from some of the most dangerous pre-existing uh, conditions uh, that, that make them um, incredibly susceptible to losing their lives uh, because, mm -hmm. because of, 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 of this pandemic. Um, should we have a focused effort working with physicians on, and I'm sure some doctors are already doing that, but if not, how can we, we help there? So maybe a, a compilation um, that we can work on, uh, everyone here on the call, let's, 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 let's see how, uh, you know, what we're already doing, uh, what, we, what our interests uh, are. Uh, some of you have rigid rules around philanthropy of your, of your various organizations. We can only do this, we can only do that. It, it, it might be helpful to put all that on one document uh, that we can then um, share amongst each other. And, and again, um, direct limited resources to areas that, that might, that might um, uh, need them most. Uh, so, so the answer right now, Muhammad, is everywhere, okay? Uh, every, everywhere, we, we all, we, uh, we know that there's some folks who have greater needs right now and, and greater limitations. So uh, back to our, our central questions, uh, um, you know, access to care, uh, you know, access to services in, in the neighborhoods, uh, access to, to good information, um, you know, how you support some of these um, uh, low-wage employees, 80% of African Americans can't work from home. Uh, you know, you got, they got to they got to go, and, and we're overrepresented in those jobs that require kind of face-to-face -face contact. Very different, uh, difficult to socially distance. So, how can we make sure maybe that that just that some folks in that community, um, uh, that, that that subset of of our citizens have PPE, uh, and, and then also obviously how we do it all going together. Back to the, the gist of your of your question. So let let's see if we can maybe compile a document very quickly that then might allow us to very thoughtfully uh, resource those, those individual needs so we're all doing something together. Um, Dr. Burke? Thank you that, Mayor, um, but we are happy to help. We, uh, the Place Fellows and the Center for Leadership and Social Change um, have been working hard. Campus right now at Columbia College is pretty ghosting. We actually have four students on campus. Um, we have been able to place everybody else as far as when I think about workforce things. Um, I have been in touch with the people that we regularly collaborate with, but I would um, underscore what Councilman Davis said. Um, I think now is the time for immediate problem solving, but I also think that this is a time to look at the social implications of healthcare and, and bigger issues. Um, and I'm, I'd be happy to anything that we're doing in any context we have to contribute to a, a, a compiled document. Well, I just know that I just know that some of the great work that you and the place fellows and so yeah. you, you guys I mean, we're still doing, doing that at, you know, as we can, we're still in touch with people. We're still working at transitions. We're, you know, we're, we're doing what we can as we can. Um, but I am wide open for advice on how to deal with some of these issues of inequity and how to impact what we can in, in the situations that we're in. I think we're all, that's why we're here. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we have, I don't see any other hands raised and we got maybe about, about seven minutes left. 
Uh, did anyone else have anything for the for the good of the order that they want they wanted to share before we started putting a a, a bow on things and some and some additional next steps? Feel free to jump in. Okay. All right, so, Mayor Benjamin. Please. Hey, I'm sorry. I don't know how to the hand. I was trying to find it. First of all, thank you so much for coordinating this outstanding call. Thank you so much to our city and county council representatives and all the outstanding individuals who are involved in this work. Um, I will be sure to send an update your way to a part of the compiled list to share a little bit about the work with the North Columbia Youth Empowerment Initiative that we've been working on. We uh, remain very active, meet as a group weekly. This involves uh, neighborhood leaders throughout what we're calling different boroughs in the 29203 community, as well as different social service providers and uh, sometimes different speakers to come in to share about resources. Uh, we have been proud to work with groups like Senior Resources. Uh, on Wednesday, nearly 600 meals went across 10 different neighborhoods through the neighborhood leaders. Um, tomorrow, uh, actually, as we were on the call, we had some volunteers packing up packages of lettuce, lettuce that was being donated. Um, small sugar meals will go out tomorrow. That is to um, not just restricted to seniors, but any families in need that may be homebound. Um, we've had different like care packages go out, coloring books, things of that nature. So there are great ways if there are the, I know there's um, outstanding service organizations throughout our community. I recognize a lot of great faces on the call. Um, I'm proud that this can help serve as an umbrella and easy way to bridge some of the outstanding giving and philanthropy that exists in our community to the residents in need through the leadership of our neighborhood residents. And I think that would be a final plug that I'll leave on this call. I'm so thankful that you put this together. As we move forward and think about solutions, which I'm so glad that Councilman Davis brought up about thinking about those systemic um, inequities that exist that need to be addressed. I mean, certainly there's so much that have already been in discussion before COVID related to housing, employment, things of that nature. Um, but another big one that we need to consider is also the role of trust. and what we've been hearing from residents is not that they don't, especially in some of the affordable housing communities, is not that they don't understand the importance of social distancing measures, but that there's not a lot of hope for why to continue to engage. And I think we know that, and we continue to hear through our partners and these outstanding neighborhood leaders is the need for that peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and networking. So as we think about our next steps, building a resilient, Columbia building our next steps, how we invest in those natural leaders to build their capacity and training to help serve as bridges to get us um, through this next um, journey ahead would just be a plug for that has been circling in my head a lot. Thank you so much, Cassie. Um, yeah, we get some really great um, uh, questions as well. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to put a, bow on this and try to be great a good steward of your time obviously um we all have a lot of meetings a lot of Zoom meetings and webex and every every other uh, uh tool so we don't want to overwhelm anyone but obviously we also want to underscore the urgency uh, of, of the moment so we're going to have to meet again and i think if we spend enough quality time in between uh of sharing uh, uh um uh, information in meaningful ways because some of this will be simply matchmaking um, um, back to uh, um, um, I think maybe Muhammad's question. I mean, so there are some great needs out there. I know that um, Serve and Connect and, and, um, uh, and uh, Dr. Burke and Lauren, uh, your work at, at uh, Columbia College, uh, that, that need to be met there. So maybe we're just connecting the dots in some regards. Um, so we'll ask this, this, this group to uh, reconnect again I will ask you all uh, very much for your help uh, to help us also determine who's missing on this call. Obviously, I, 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 I interface regularly, had a great call and uh, discussion with um, the superintendents of Richmond 1, Richmond 2, and Lexington Richmond 5 yesterday. They're all doing amazing work and, and doing their very level best to keep our children engaged and, 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 and fed and meeting their emotional and spiritual needs and all, all the above. Uh, but um, um, Someone just asked a question in, in, in the chat about, about tutoring uh, and uh, why, Mark, uh, about, about tutoring. Are there, are there ways in which we might be able to, to continue to, to help young people since we're not 
uh, able to walk into the schools and, and, and do lunch buddies or whatever it happens to be. Uh, that's probably something I'm sure the, uh, the superintendents have been thinking about, but they they had to um, stop on a dime and and and, and start uh, um, uh, a new way of, of, of virtual learning. That I've been very impressed with what they've been able to achieve. But but um, think about who else is missing and needs to be on these calls uh, prospectively. Uh, the um, uh, uh, Taylor is going to go ahead and, and reach out to all of you. Let's make sure we have uh, your contact information. And again, we want to know what, you, what you're doing, uh, what, your, what your interests uh, uh, are in helping with. If you hadn't, everyone's got some resources, time, talent, the treasures, so something you want to help out with. And then um, even more so, if you've identified some needs that might not uh, be addressed and, and, and that understanding that, that whatever you share with us is going to be shared with the entire group. Um, so, so we're we're going to try to in a in a, um, in a very meaningful way uh, break down silos and make sure we're all communicating because that because we need all all hands on deck right now um, to help our, our our citizens who need us the, uh, um, the most right now the most right now. So, uh, I I think I, I I don't see any more hands. I'm sorry, Pietra. Did you have one more uh, a final word? Just my final word, I, I know that you'd already put a bow on everything, okay. um, but I just wanted to, um, again, just to accentuate, I think what all of us are saying here, that this is not a one and done. It's not when, when we start to see the decline that it's over. Um, had a meeting with our um, colleagues this morning and it was very evident that this is the new norm. And when we start to see that decline, and the numbers flattening, it doesn't mean everything is okay. So when we start to plan, it's planning not just for one month, two months, it's years ahead. So I just wanted to, um, again, accentuate that um, and kind of wrap that up for everybody. It's it's not one and done. It's This is a new norm. It's not going to be over with. It may, it may be helpful too. Um, so after a, a, a webinar yesterday in which it, there was some really detailed polling of citizens mm -hmm. in North and South Carolina. Uh, that it was it was more business focused, but it really was uh, helping understand uh, citizen sentiment. And in reality, yes, that this that, that Americans uh, the attention spans may be pretty uh, short right now, uh, but they're going to have to be elongated somewhat significantly uh, if we're going to actually weather this the way that we know we can. Uh, every single life is precious, and, and, and it's so easy to default. Uh, to to thinking about statistics and and, and how uh, uh, what our what our um, uh, fatality rate might be and everything else. Um, every every life we lose is, is someone's uh, mother, father, child, son, uh, daughter, uh, auntie, or uh, beloved. So anything we can do now uh, to 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 save lives, um, it's worth it. It's worth its weight in gold. So, but yes, we're going to have to be in this for the long haul, and we're going to have to constantly communicate. Um, so, um, so let, let's, let's do that. We will pull everyone together again. We will pull everyone together on a, um, on an email list. We'll start, I will really need you all to make a commitment, uh, to respond to the questions that Taylor sends out promptly so we can, we can, um, share that information and maybe start getting a whole bunch of partnerships going on that we, um, uh, we want to, we want to activate and mobilize even in between the times that we get together uh, on, on a, on a meeting. So. Uh, thank you to my colleagues, um, uh, City Council. Thank you to each and every one of you across this community that are doing work, particularly uh, those of you who are very much on the front lines um, making this happen. We, we appreciate you. And um, let's, let's move forward as, as one, one great community. God bless you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, brother.